And uh, I believe that this team will excite you. And it will uh, enrich you greatly. The team is the authority of God's word. So today we are starting with the title, The Symbols and Functions of the Word of God. The Symbols and Functions of the Word of God. The Symbols and the Functions of God's Word. Now, we're going to be looking at 16 things. What our concepts in life, uh, uh, philosophy in life, that is contrary to the word of God. All the ideologies and the opinions we have, the word of God is like a hammer that breaks them down. You know why some people are not growing? They are not growing because of these things that they have believed over the years. They have made up their mind what they are going to do, and anything you are saying is your own. Some will even tell you it's not everything that you are so preached that I take. Some will tell you it's not everything the word of God says that I take. Somebody told me many years ago, he said the word of God is history book. And the Bible is history book. To him is history book. But to me, it is the word of life for every day. I told him it contains history, but it's not history book. It's a word of life. It's a life today. I see it come to pass every day in my life. So it is the attitude that you have towards God that will determine how you relate with his word. So all these concepts are Paul referred to as strongholds. And once these strongholds are not pulled down, it won't prosper. The thing grew because of the little soil that came by wind and all that. And uh, when the heat will come, when the sun will come out like it came out today, it will burn it up because the roots did not go down. All the little moisture it has will dry up. And once it's dry, the plant will dry. But assuming the soil is soft and is able to penetrate, that's why when farmers want to farm, they first plow the ground. They make heaps and ridges. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? So make it softer. So that when they plant the seed, it will be easy for the seed to go down. Because it, before the seed will start going up, it has to first go down. So it's growing both ways. It's going, growing downwards and it's growing upwards. It's only a plant that does that. It goes down and it goes up. So if it doesn't go down well, it can't survive the heat of the sun. It can't survive the harsh weather. So as it's growing, so the roots are getting bigger and bigger. That's why you see, after some time, the coconut tree is breaking your wall. After some time, the, all the trees are beginning to get fatter, and then they are cracking the walls because they are still growing inside the ground. Not only growing down, they are getting fatter and stronger. So, but a strong heart it's not easy to penetrate. The rocky heart is not easy to penetrate. So how do you now break it down? The hammer. What is a hammer? The word of God. So as you're preaching to the person, you say, the more I preach, the more the person is misbehaving. The more you cancel, the more the person is misbehaving. Because the rock, the concept, the opinion the person is holding is too strong. So the only way to destroy it is the word. Keep preaching the word. Keep speaking the truth. Don't give up. That's why I tell pastors, if we repeat a message, you have not done anything wrong. Keep preaching the truth. Keep preaching the truth. Keep preaching the same message. You may rearrange it. You may come from another angle, but it's the same truth. Because until it enters, it has not entered. And when you are hammering a rock, you don't see sign of crack outside. So if you are not consistent and not determined, you will give up. Because your hand will be telling you, hey, I'm getting tired. You are hammering away. You are feeling it in your hand. And there is no sign that the thing is cracking. But what you don't know is that at the center, it is breaking up. That's the nature of rock. It doesn't crack from outside. It cracks from the middle, from the center. So as you are hammering and hammering, 
as the word is entering, it's touching the heart. It's hitting the truth. Hitting that problem area. Touching that area with truth. The light of God is shining into that dark area. That knowledge the person had that is making him not to respond is being dealt with inside. And once the thing now is overpowered, you just see without any sign, the whole thing will just make bra. That's how rocks are. So the word of God is a hammer that breaks it. You can't change anybody with beating. But you can change them with the word of God. I hope someone is hearing me. So it smashes and demolishes evil and wrong beliefs, concepts, ideologies, opinions, and mental strongholds. This is the reason why you must bring your children to church. Punishing them, beating them, scolding them, cursing them, pushing their head, making their head to hit the wall, knocking their head, slapping their face, will not do what the word of God can do. And it's not everything you can teach. So, make sure they come to church. Send them to the children's department. Let them be taught. Bring them to Bible study where you are coming. Don't leave them at home. When there is a program in the church, bring them. You think they are not hearing? They are hearing. Who said they are not hearing? Ask them questions. When you get home, you'll be shocked what your little child will tell you that he heard. Even you, you need the word. Don't send your wife and stay at home. Don't send the children and stay at home. Come. The word will help to reshape in you. It is a hammer that breaks rocks in pieces. Number three. The word is like a lamp. The word is what? Like a lamp. Psalm 119 verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A lamp. Unto my feet and a light unto my path. How many of you know that if you have a touch light, it's easy to move around in the dark? How many of you also know that the touch light cannot be as bright as this hall? Because we have many bulbs, and all of them together brightens the place the more. How many of you also know that all the lights here cannot be compared to daylight? And so when you are in the daylight, you see, you can see how far because everywhere is clear. But when you are in the dark and you have your touch light, you can only see as far as the light that you have. How many of you understand what I'm trying to say? In other words, the more enlightened you are in the word of God, the brighter your vision. The farther you can see. The, you know, the more, more progress will come to you. Because you can see far, you can see far, you can reason work better. You can come to right conclusions. Because everything will be laid bare before you, nothing hidden. But if your light is small, then you can only make little progress. And that is why you need light. And the Bible says, the word of God is what? The lamp and the light. So it is an instrument of light and illumination. In the darkness. It shows and points. To the right path. To be followed. That's what the word of God does. It shows and points to the right path. Just as your touch. Will show you the right path to take. This one is a pit. This one is a level ground. There's a stone here. And there's nothing here. There is bushes here. Hey look at that thing that is moving there. Don't go there. Pass this way. That's what the light shows you. And that's what the word of God it shows you the path that you will take. You want a successful marriage? The word of God will show you how. You want a peaceful home? The word of God will show you how. You want to succeed in your choosing career? The word of God will show you how. You want to live a safe and protected life? The word of God will show you how. So you see, the word of God is important to you. If you don't want to stumble and fall, if you want to live a peaceful, happy, prosperous life, you need the word. Change your attitude to the Bible. Number four, the word is like a mirror. Ladies will understand this better because they always carry mirror everywhere they go. James chapter 1, verse 23 and verse 24. 
For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. That glass there means mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgeteth what manner of man he was. He sees himself in a glass, in a mirror. As soon as he leaves the place, he has forgotten how he was looking like. That's how many of us behave. You come to the world, come to Bible study, come to church, hear the word. On your own, you carry the Bible, read the word. As soon as you are closing your Bible, you have forgotten what you read. You are like a person who looks at himself, cannot remember whether he was yellow or black. Whether there was a spot here or no spot. How many of us live like that? That's what he's trying to say. In other words, the word of God mirrors your life to you. It shows you how God sees you in the now. And it shows you how God expects you to live. So when you see God in the world and compare yourself with God, you'll be able to see how far you are. You look at God's standard in the world and look at yourself now. You'll be able to see whether you are close or far. It reveals to us what we are in the sight of the righteous judge. Are you hearing me? God is what? A righteous judge. So the word of God reveals to you what you are in the sight of the righteous judge. As his expectations are made clear to you in the word. And what we can be in God through Jesus Christ. So it does not only show you what you are presently, the level of spirituality, whether God is satisfied or not, but it shows you what you can be through Christ. That is, if you allow Jesus to have his way, how your life will look like. So without the word, you can't do it. Prayer is good, but prayer can't do these things. Fasting is good. Fasting can only enhance, you know, your work with God by helping you to Kill all the weights, eliminate the weights, con you know, confront the devil, and let your spirit man rise so you can get closer. But it cannot pass you the knowledge. It is knowledge that changes us. It is the word that changes us. That's where the life is. That's where the power is. So enjoy the word. Surrender to the word. Love the word. Read it. Hear it. Believe it. Give yourself to it and leave it out. Number five. The world is like milk. Oh. Who likes milk? Huh? Oh, my. It's like milk. Good milk. When you are drinking it, you are enjoying it. What does milk do? What does the milk do? Mothers are here. What does the milk do for a baby? It passes the nutrients. All the nutrients that the baby needs into the body of the baby. All the minerals, all the uh, what they call them. The, all the minerals and all the all the vitamins and whatever for full development of the child is passed on. That's what the word of God is. Everything you need to grow. Everything you need to, you know, to become mature. Everything you need to form and become more like Christ. To manifest Jesus in every area of your life is passed on to you through the word. So who wants to grow here? Who wants to be nourished? You need the word. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world, that you may grow thereby. So the world makes you grow. The world does what? Makes you grow. What does the world do? Makes you grow. The world makes you grow. The world makes you grow. The world makes you grow. you grow. 
It nourishes the young in Christ unto maturity. It is our instrument of spiritual growth. So you must know the word. You must consume the word. You must feed on the word. Imagine a baby without milk. The baby will die. Will not form well. Imagine you without the word of God, you won't form well. That's why we tell you believers' foundation class is important for newcomers. School of the word is important for every believer. Bible study is important. Personal, daily reading and studying of the word of God is important. Little by little be consuming the word. Little by little be consuming the word. Little by little be consuming the word. You'll be growing. You need it. You need it. Number six, the word is like a seed. Ah. You see, the various symbols and functions of God's word. By the time we're done, you will understand the word of God, the role the word of God plays in your life, and you will value it more. You will give it more attention. That's my desire. And I pray to be achieved in Jesus' name. I didn't hear that, amen. The word is like a seed. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. But the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. A seed that does not get corrupt, destroyed. Not infected with insects. A seed that will produce. A seed that will produce a clean life, a righteous life, a holy life. So the word of God is lacking to what? A seed. And every seed is planted and must germinate. And when it germinates, it grows. And then it bears fruit. And when the fruit is ready for harvest, you will not harvest it. So the word of God is likened to a seed. You know, when you are sharing the word of God, you are speaking the word of God to somebody, and the person is not responding, you have not wasted your time completely. You have planted a seed. It may take a while. It may produce immediately. It may take some time. It may take even months or probably years. But every word that you speak is a seed. Everything I'm speaking to your hearing is a seed I am planting in you. And do you know that any other person who is speaking to you, any other thing is also planting seeds because words are seeds. I'm going to talk of God's word. But this one is incorruptible. Now look at Luke chapter 8 verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Jesus is now interpreting the parable of the sower. He says, so I went out to sow some seed. So he's not telling you, the seed is the word of God. So the word of God is seed. So you and I can never tell when that seed will bear fruit. But it has been planted. I think is it a year or two ago, some of my old sons in the Lord, they, they were reaching out to me one by one on Facebook. They will talk about those days. They will be thanking me for planting some good seeds in them that I laid the foundation upon which their lives are built today. The one who is not a pastor is either married to a pastor or something. And they are doing well. They are happy when we were in school in those days. So the seed has been planted and the seed will produce results. So when it will produce, I don't know, but certainly will produce. The person may not be on fire today, but the seed has been planted. Tomorrow, the fire will start to burn. But I wish it will burn in my time. I want to see the person burn when the person is with me. But sometimes it doesn't happen that way until the person goes away. Then the fire starts. Then the spirit stirs the person up. And all the things the person remember, he will remember Pastor Sylvester. He will remember the words that Pastor Sylvester used to speak. He will remember the things Pastor Sylvester used to teach. That's what he'll just be remembering there. Remembering there. And those things will not be what he'll be using to work. The seed. So the word of God is a seed. And every seed reproduces itself. That's why God said, The words that I speak unto you shall not return back to me void. It must accomplish that which I propose and prosper in that which I've said. It. it must produce. It's a seed. And Jesus said the words, you know, he said, uh, the words I speak unto, they are spirit and their life. So the life and the spirit of God is in the word. To make it produce, to make it bear fruit. So the word of 
cannot fail to produce. He said, it cannot return back to me empty, void, without producing. Without accomplishing the purpose of which I sent it, it must bear fruit. So anything God says to you, embrace it, it will come to pass. You may not know how long it will come to pass. It will not fail. Amen? Somebody say, God is faithful. James chapter 1 verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He begat us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits. How do you talk of first fruit if there is no seed? So the seed is planted and then it germinates. Then the plant begins to mature. Then comes to the time when he's able to bear fruit. And then the fruit matures for harvest, ripens for harvest, and it goes and gathers the first batch, which is called the first fruit. So it's a seed. And it will produce high quality life that can be called first fruit. So yield to the word. Submit to the word. Forget about all these tales, all these stories people are telling here and there. I would rather believe God than believe the economy of the country. Believe what economists are telling me. I would rather believe God than believe what the doctor is telling me. I'm telling you the absolute truth. I will hear you quite well, but I put my faith in the word because I know the word will not fail. You can tell me all you want to tell me, but the word of God is where I stand. I am a product of the word. I seek God. Prove it again and again that the word works. And there's nobody who can tell me the word does not bear fruit. Nobody. Because I am a living testimony that the word works. So it is a germinating, life producing word. I'm talking of the word of God. A germinating, life producing word. Having the potential of eternal life within it. It has the capacity to give you the life of God. Help you become like Christ and manifest him on a daily basis in every area. Number seven. The word is like a sword. Woo! Ephesians calls it the sword of the spirit. He said, take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. So the word of God serves as helmet of salvation to protect your mind from being taken over by the devil and serves as a sword in the spirit to strike and cut through your enemy. How does it work? When you quote it in faith. When you believe it, when you store it, store it in your mind, you read it and store it. Believe in it, it becomes a helmet. So when the devil comes with his thoughts, you will suddenly remember what is written. And that will save you, help you to be able to resist the devil and overcome. Then when you quote it in faith against the enemy, against any situation or circumstance of life, it becomes a sword in the spirit. And it cuts your enemy. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Pierce even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So the word of God has the ability to penetrate and cut through to any, any realm of man. It cuts through to the spirit, separating spirit from the flesh, separating the bones, the marrows, getting to the thoughts, to the mind, every area it touches. So sharp. It's double-edged. You know, there's a difference between your kitchen knife and a sword. The kitchen knife is only one side, one edged, that is sharp. The sword is double-edged. This left side is sharp, the right side is sharp, so it cuts both ways. So the word of God cuts. What does that mean? Convicts. It convicts. It reaches to every part. It has the ability to penetrate every area of your life and work on it and produce results. So it's sharp and through double edge in its operation, separating the things of the flesh and of the spirit. How many of you also know that the Bible says uh, 
I said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live. Hmm? That's the word. In other words, the word can produce life and can produce death. It can give blessing and it can give cause. Meaning, every aspect of the word of God comes to pass. You believe the word, it works for you. Good. You don't believe the word, the judgment God decreed must come to pass. So you walk in agreement with the word it will produce. You walk contrary to the word it will produce. Whichever way is double-edged. It cuts both ways. So do you want the word of God to produce in your life? Believe. Act on it. It will bear fruit positively. Not the negative one. Amen? Number eight. The word is like water. The word is like what? Water. Woo. It is like giving. It refreshes. It cleanses. It washes. It transforms. It's an instrument in the hands of God for washing us clean. The word. Please let's look at these scriptures. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. Ephesians 5 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Jesus is working on the church to sanctify. The word to sanctify means to make clean and to set apart for God's holy use. How does he do that? He cleanses us with the washing of water. So he's using the word like you use water to wash your dishes clean. Like you use water to wash your body clean. Like you use water to wash your house clean. That's how God is using the word to wash us clean. So every time you're hearing the word, what is God doing? He's cleansing you. He's expecting you to respond positively to what you have heard and to make corrections. So in the area where you have been enlightened and convicted, you will make adjustments. You are washed in that area. Then God will go to another area. That's how God keeps working in every, every department of your life, every compartment of your life until you are fully clean. So without the word of God, we cannot really manifest Christ. Not possible. Though you are born again, but you need the word to be able to manifest him because the word is a cleansing agent. That's the water with which God will wash you clean. John 15 verse 3. John 15 verse 3. Sancti 15 verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Ye are clean. How do you clean something without water? So the word is a cleansing agent. The word is what? A cleansing agent. Ye are clean by the word which I have spoken unto you. So as they receive the word, the word clean them up. As they receive the word, the word clean them up. As you are hearing, the word is affecting your mind. And as it's affecting your mind, you are thinking, you're making adjustments, you're making corrections, and you turn things around. John 17, 17. Chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. To sanctify, like I said, is to make clean and set apart for God's holy use. To cleanse. So again, Jesus said, it is truth that you will use to sanctify them. And your word is truth. So the word of God is to cleanse us. So what are we doing now? We are in the process of cleaning up our lives. And what are we using? We're using the word. So you need to love the word. You need to cherish the word. You need to embrace the word. You need to take the word of God serious. You need to pay attention when they are teaching you. Switch off your phone. Pay attention. Don't allow distractions. Don't sit close to your friend or your brother or your sister if you know they will discuss with you when the word of God is going on. Because God said, son, pay attention to what I say. Incline thy ear to my sayings. That's how you receive from God. You pay attention. How do you receive in class? You pay attention when the teacher is teaching. 
Some of you who are parents, you know sometimes when you are saying some serious things to your child, you will pull the ear. Or you pull your own ear. You say, I hope you heard what I said. Am I correct? It's either you're pulling the child's ear, you're pulling your own ear. And the child is looking at you, pulling your own ear. You are dramatizing, trying to show the child how serious about you are about what you're saying. I hope you heard what I said. So you must pay attention. Psalm 119. We want to, we're going to read verse 5 and verse 9. Psalm 119. Verse 5 says, Oh, that my ways were di directed to keep thy status. This reveals his heart and his prayer. That his ways were directed to keep the status of God. That God will direct his paths. God will order his steps. God will lead him to keep the status. Obey God in everything. Now verse 9. He has, he's not asking a question. Where will thou shall a young man cleanse his way by taking his dear toe? According to the word. How can I keep my path clean? How can I live a clean life? He said, by taking heed unto thy word. That's all. So the only way to clean up your life is the word of God. You do what God says. He's your father. He's your God. He's your judge. You are going to stand before him on the last day. He is the one who determines everything. So you, you don't see sometimes some of us, we treat the word of God with levity. Sometimes you are in church. You are reading the word of God. You are also playing a sound message from your phone. At the same time, you are answering messages. You are chatting with somebody. And you are in the church. You are hearing the word. It doesn't make sense. You are telling God you are not as important as this, my friend. And it doesn't make sense. You must give God respect. He is your God, for God's sake. Must he, first of all, come and shake the place. And then the whole place will be shaking. Bruh, 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 bruh. So when you are reading the Bible, you are shaking. No. He doesn't want that. Recognize who he is. Respect him. If it's five minutes you want to use to study, pay attention. Take what you're learning serious and apply it to your life. If it's ten minutes you are able to use, use ten minutes, use it well. I don't believe you must study for one hour for studying purpose so that you'll be telling everybody I spent one hour every day in the Bible. What did you learn? Zero. No. I don't believe in reading ten chapters a day and you can't remember one thing that you read. So if it's a verse of scripture that you studied, You'll be able to answer questions on that verse. Anybody who asks you questions on that verse, you'll be able to analyze it. You'll be able to explain what you read and how it impacted your life. If it's a chapter you read, you'll be able to tell the story and answer questions on it. Is that how you are reading your Bible? I'm not sure. So change. Give the word of God attention. That's what we're doing. So you will understand the power in the word and why God has placed the word before us. He put the word in our hands so we can learn, so we can grow. See the role the word plays, the function of the word of God in your life. It is the water that washes your soul. So it is life-giving, refreshing and cleansing and transforming agent so we can become what God intends us to be. Praise the Lord. Number nine, the word is more valuable than gold. The word is more valuable than gold. What value do you place on the word of God? How do you value the word of God? Is it important to you? Is it what pastors use to manipulate people like some say? Is it what pastors use to make people to be at our beck and call so we can milk them and collect from them? You know how much you have given me now? I don't know how many of you have been sending me money. You understand what I'm saying? Nobody's making anybody here. Nobody's asking you to bring or give anybody. Nobody's stopping anybody. Nobody's playing games with anybody. All we are telling you is learn the word and walk with God. So your life will be better. Leave all those things that people say. Stop listening to all those rubbish. Those are agents of the devil sent to distract people from following God. The word is written. I told my own father. He's late now. I told him. I said, to you it may be history. But to me, it is the word of life. Later on in life, he knelt down. I placed my hands on his head and prayed for him. He received Jesus. The word will always prevail. He is supposed to put his hand on my head as my father. But when it comes to spiritual things, he must recognize. With his own mouth, he said, a prophet is not honored except amongst his own people. He said so. He knelt down so I should pray for him because death was hovering in the family. Praise 
Praise the Lord, somebody. Believe the word. It will make you great. Believe the word. It will make you a champion. What made David a champion? The word. The same word of God that others know. David believed. David stored it in his heart. David embraced it. David built his life on it. When Goliath stepped out, fear gripped them. Goliath David, young fellow, 17 years old, who has never gone to war before, came out. He doesn't even know how to use a sword. He has never won an armor before in his life. When the king gave it to him, he was, he couldn't move around. He said, I will, I will not win with this thing. He removed this. I'm not used to it. He went like a shepherd boy, like I'm wearing shirt and trousers. That's how he went, like that. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should disgrace the armies of the living God? What does that mean? This man does not have a covenant relationship with God. We have covenant with God. We are Israelites. And by that covenant, he said, we, we possess the gates of our enemies. By that covenant, the Lord said, the battle is his, not our own. So why are you guys afraid? He's uncircumcised. He's not covenanted to God, the God of heaven. So I'm going to defeat him. So it is his faith in the world that gave him the courage and the boldness to step up. It was the faith he had that made him face lions and face bears and defeated them. It was his faith also that made him to, you know, to know that truly Goliath will fall. And he killed him. He said, I'm going to cut off your head and give your body to the best of the earth to feed on. Hmm? Meanwhile, he does not have a knife, no sword, nothing. He was banking on the man's sword. So when he used his sling and shot that stone, aimed very well, and with the help of God, bah, the team penetrated the man's thick skull. You know somebody who is nine feet tall? Thick skull. The man fell to the ground. He didn't give him time to shake and recover. He ran after him. I mean, ran towards him. And then took his sword from his hand and chopped off his head and lifted the man's head. Victory won. Prophecy fulfilled. How? Faith in, in the world. Don't just read for reading's sake. Don't just hear for hearing's sake. Leave it out. Believe it. Trust God to make it come to pass. Some of you are not dirty because you are afraid. Who told you God will not supply when you honor him? You are afraid. That's unbelief. You make promises. You are not able to keep your promises. What's your problem? You are scared. What of if I'm not able? Then you have no faith. Our relationship with God is a journey of if I make a pledge, the first thing I do is attend to my, my pledge. I leave everything I have. Because once I put it in the hands of God, God will turn it around and then things will start to work out. But for some people, no. They want to solve all their problems first. And then the thing will pile up and the devil will not take advantage of it and start to create problems for them. Believe God. Let the word build faith in you. Let the word build faith in you. Let the word build faith in you. Don't just attend to it as if it's nothing. What value do you place on God's word? We are reading 9 number 9. That the word is more valuable than gold. Psalm 19 verse 7 to 10. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired a day than after telling you all the things the world will do for you. He said, more to be desired a day than gold. Desire the world more than gold. More than material things, more than shoe, more than money. These some people put what? Put the Bible here now. And put a uh, one Versace shoe. So we take the shoe. Leave the Bible. But what the word of God will give you, that shoe will not give you. The place the word of God will take you to, that shoe will not take you to that place. What the word of God will protect you from, that shoe will not protect you from it. I 
I don't know if someone is understanding what I'm saying. More to be desired are they than gold. Yeah, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. The word of God is sweeter than honey. So the word of God is also likened to honey. We'll come to that. Now, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. For the honor of, of kings is to search out the matter. And the Bible says he made us to be kings and priests unto his God that we may reign here on earth. So God wants you to search out. How do you search out? Study. It is to your honor to search out the matter. So you need to learn to dig. How do you get gold? You search for it. You dig. You mine. They go deep into the ground, sometimes up to one kilometer inside the ground, looking for gold, collecting. They may be here, but they have already reached uh, Jedodo. Inside the ground, collecting gold, because they can't be opening every hole, hope here. they just be going down and then following the thing as it's going, collecting and collecting. As they are collecting, so they are going. They are collecting, they are, the thing is increasing. The distance, they, people die sometimes inside because it's too deep. Sometimes the thing cave in, collapses. What is holding the earth to collapse and the thing will fall. And they will not start doing rescue. Miners go through a lot because there's a lot of money in it. Praise the Lord, somebody. By the time they are finished purifying the gold and use it to make jewelry, then they tell you price. Uh, and today in the world, you know, nations of the world keep their money in gold. That's what they use for their reserve. Some people want to use the US dollar because it can fail. Money can fail, but gold doesn't fail. The value of gold keeps going up because it's more difficult to mine it now. It costs more to mine it, so the value keeps going up. So some people don't want to keep their money in the bank. Rather, they want to go and buy gold and keep it in the house. I'm not talking of jewelry and all this. Maybe need gold, melt it. Use small, small, what do you call them now? Uh, gold bars, small, small gold bars, and keep it at home. But the word of God is more precious than gold. So it is of priceless value. Priceless value. You can't quantify the value of God's word. No one word to use. There's nothing in this world you can say is as valuable as the word. Jesus asked, what shall it profit a man if he shall take the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul? In other words, there's nothing in this world that you can use to compare the value of one's soul to. Nothing. Not money, not house, not wealth, not power, not position. So the Bible is an inexhaustible mind. Where one can dig out treasures forever. It is the honor of kings to search out a matter. Dig it out. Find it. Spend time. Search out the scriptures concerning that problem. How do I solve it? How do I overcome this? How do I tackle this? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? You are searching. You are reading. That's what God wants. And it's to your glory, your own honor. Rather than talking and quarreling and complaining and grumbling, go into the word. Search it out. Then start to pray. And start to act on the word. And your story will change in Jesus' name. Number 10. The word is like honey. Ecclesiastes, sorry. Uh, Psalm 19 verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey. And the honeycomb. So the word of God is sweeter than honey. How many of you have tasted real honey? I'm not talking of sugar burnt to look like honey. Real honey. Have you tasted it? Eh? The thing is sweet, right? The Bible is sweeter than honey. You know, because you feel it's boring, that's why you don't read it. I used to tell people, please, I'm not, uh, I believe in King James. I believe in any trans modern translation. If the language is too old for you, too difficult to understand, and that's why some people find it difficult to read. Pray for simple versions like NIV or Reverse Standard Version, anything. Just read it. 
living Bible is paraphrased Bible, it will also help you to understand. You can have both, have King James, have this one, read it. It's interesting to read. I know the difficult part is when you are reading the genealogies, like in Leviticus, uh, all those laws and laws and laws and laws may be difficult. Well, that's not the only thing in the Bible. Praise the Lord, somebody. The word of God is sweet. You know how it feels when you discover a truth. Wow. You feel excited. Somebody said something, you catch the revelation. Wow. You see somebody shout, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I see it. I see it. I see it. What did you see? Something just came out from the scripture. It's sweet, my brother. My sister, it's very sweet. The Bible is sweet. I like doing something. I like to listen to the word of God read to me. I have a, a Bible version, NIV version, that was dramatized. And then it makes the Bible come alive. I listen to it while I drive. As I was ironing today, I was listening to it. So I don't want to waste my time. My hands are busy, but my ears will be enjoying it. I read, I, will I say I read now, I listened to many books within the short period that I did the iron. So the word is going inside me. As I'm driving, the word is going inside me. Sometimes I put my ear, what do you call it, earpiece. I plug it to my phone. I'm listening to the word. I am walking. I am hearing the word. You don't have to only read. You can listen. If you want it, I will give it to you for free. For free. So long as you have enough space, you have at least five gigabytes, five GB space, enough space to accommodate it. Listen to it. Some of your, the app that you are using, it comes with free audio Bible. Listen to it. Sometimes you are reading maybe a little bit inconveniencing because of what you are doing, but you are listening. It's playing at the background and you are hearing it and it's seeping into you and you are understanding things. So with that, you can listen to the whole Bible over and over and over and over and over and over again in one year. Maybe up to ten times. May the Lord bless you. I said, may the Lord bless you. Revelation chapter 10 verse 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. The thing went to work. Sweet as honey. So it is sweet to the taste. It is palatable. The word of God is palatable. It's exciting to eat it. Uh, Jeremiah said, the word of God came to me and I did eat it. Eat it. It is exciting to read, study, and use. That's what it means. Number 11. The word is like an ox goat. What's an ox goat? I don't know if you've ever seen an ox. You know these farmers that till the ground, they have this animal. They put a, uh, you know, a yoke on, top, on the uh, back of the ox. And then it comes down with a plowing uh, part of it. So as it's moving, the thing is plowing the ground. And they are using that thing to control the ox. It's called an ox goat. It is an instrument which prods, nudges, pushes, stirs the oxen into fulfilling its duties. For in the place of oxen, I put a believer. That's what the word does. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 11. He said, the words of the wise are as goats and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies which are given from one shepherd. So these goats, they are using to control, to pro, to push, to control, to stare. To cause the animal to obey what they want him to do. To fulfill his assignment. To fulfill his duties. And so the word of God is planted in you to help you, prompt you, push you, stir you to do what God wants you to do. So you want to please God, you need the word. The word keeps working on you. The word of God keeps working on you, pushing you, stirring you up. 
pushing you, steering you, nudging you to go ahead and do what God wants you to do, to make sure that your life is in line. Because you can't hear and not do. You cannot know the truth and refuse to walk in it. Do you understand? So as you are here, that you want to be a doer. Number 12, the word is like a nail. The same scripture. Say, Bob. You've jumped to. The words of the wise are as goats and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies. It is fastened in a sharp place. We can hang things on it. What does that mean? We can build our lives on it. You can build your life on the world. That, that's how that name is. If you nail this place now, you can hang anything on it. That's how the word of God, the words of the wise. And of course, you know, God's word is a word of wisdom. It's like a nail. Fasting to this thing now, for instance. I can hang my clothes, hang anything on it. That's to say, I can build my life on the word. So the word of God is for you to build your life. Number 13. The word is like bread. Not a gege bread. Please. It's like bread. Matthew 4.4 4. But he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So he's saying to you, rather than physical bread, eat the word. Man shall not live by bread alone. Bread is for the physical body. But the word of God is for the spiritual body. But at the same time also for your physical body because it's able to keep you healthy, keep you strong, knock off sickness and diseases on your body. Remember, when he trace, dividing asunder the spirit and the soul, the bones and the marrows, the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Man shall not live by bread alone. Food is not all that you need. You need the word. You need the word. Deuteronomy 8 3. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou know and knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So man lives by. The word. How did the bread come? Which bakery baked the bread? God said, bread will come from the sky. And it did come. God said, gather each day all you can eat for one day. Don't let the one for one day see the next day. On the sixth day, it will fall twice. The volume of bread that will fall will be like two times. So that you can keep it for another day because on the seventh day Sabbath, there will be no work. Nobody will go to gather food. So you gather for two days. The same bread will last for two days. That's 48 hours. The same bread, God said to Moses, fill a jar with it, put it in the Ark of Covenant, and it will stay there forever. Now, the one that God said will last only one day, when the next day came, some people kept it, of course. They gathered more than they could eat. The Bible said the thing began to stink. Say it stank. It was smelling badly. Terribly. The whole house was smelling. When they looked into it, all of them was full of worms. The bread has turned to worms. Why? God said it has power to stay for one day. So what makes the bread? The word. What produced the bread? The word. What gives it how long it will stand? It will stay the word. When he says it's only 24 hours, after 24 hours, the thing rotten. The same bread gathered on the sixth day lasted six day, seventh day. It did not stink. It did not grow worms. The one put in the jar stayed there for years, hundreds of years, until they lost the ark. Nobody can tell where the ark is. It's still inside the ark, wherever the ark is today. Not rotten, no warm inside, not smelly. The world. 
So you can live on it. It will always produce. Whatever God says, becomes. What did I say? Whatever God says, becomes. If God said it, it will come to pass. Psalm 119 verse 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So the word of God is sweet. The word of God is exciting to be eaten. Please take it, swallow it, enjoy it. Now, it is a staff, authority, and support of life. That's what it simply means. It is a staff, that's the authority and support. Staff means authority and support of life. Ever fresh. The word is ever fresh. And meant for daily consumption. Man shall not live by bread alone. And every day we eat food. Every day we eat food. Bread means food. Every day we eat food. So if you are not to eat by bread alone, then you are to eat spiritual food. So every day, so the word of God is for daily consumption. The word of God is food for the soul of man. Can you do without the word? So if you have been treating the word of God lightly, that's why your life is the way it is. Change, and you will see changes. Number 14, the word is like a pearl. The word is like what? A pearl. Matthew 7, 6. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. That's peace. Lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. In other words, value the word. You don't take what is precious like pearls and give it to pigs. They won't value it. Where does pearls come from? From inside the ground. In that dark place where it is formed. But when you get it out and wash it and polish it, and it comes to the light, the beauty comes out. As light shines on it, it starts to glow. You see the rainbow colors, all the different colors of the pearls come out. Hello, somebody. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's to say, when you take the word of God and leave it out, the beauty of the word comes out. So the word inside you, if it is not lived out, it won't come out. That's why Jesus said, let the light so shine that men may see your good deeds. Good deeds. Leave it out. Then they will see the beauty of the word. Just like a pearl. If it's inside the ground, nobody will value it. It's of no use. But when it comes out, cleaned out, polished, and then brought to the light, under the light, man, it's beautiful. You pay any price for it. I say you will pay any price for it. Amen, somebody. So it is a, the word of God is a precious gem. Though formed in darkness, it has the colors of the rainbow when brought to the light. When the word is lived out, it is beautiful to behold. Don't hear the word. Don't just know the word. Leave it out. Let the light shine. Number 15. The word is like an anchor. How many of you know what an anchor is? How many of you have seen all those big, big ships? You see that thing that looks like, you see, well, I call it a T now. Like this, like this, and then like this. Attached to heavy chains. It's called an anchor. Very heavy, oh. Very, very heavy, depending on the side of the ship, the size of the ship. So when they, they don't want the boat to move, they drop the anchor. So the anchor will stabilize it because it's very heavy. It will not have the winds and the storm will not be able to move the boat. It will stay in that position. So when the ship to in the lower the anchor. And if the ship I want to bring it to a quick stop, they will quickly drop the anchor. If there is an emergency. And the Bible teaches us that the word of God is the anchor of our lives. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 and 19. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Verse 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entrance into that within the veil. What is he trying to say? Our hope based on the promises of God. Our hope based on the word of God. 
So the word of God gives us hope, and our hope is our anchor. So what does it mean? It means that the word of God is our anchor. Because that is where we put our hope in. What does that mean? It means it holds the believer in safety through every storm. He holds you in safety through every storm. No matter how the storm may rage, you are there. You go forward. The Bible says, they that put their trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but abides forevermore. Why do you have trust? Because you have faith in the world. Because of what he said. So you trust him because of what he said. You have confidence in his word. You have hope in his word. So your, the word is your anchor. So it will see you through any challenge. So anytime you are going through challenge, hang on to the word. Hang on to the word. Hang on to the promises of God. Hold on to the promises. Believe it. Confess it. Declare it. Pray it. We will come at triumphant. Number 16. The word is like meat. First we said it's like milk. Now we say it's like meat. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14. But strong meat. NIV says solid food. Belonged to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, it builds and matures the believer. Who wants to be mature here? Who wants to be mature? Who wants to manifest Christ in full? The word is what you need. It will build you and mature you. Hmm? Look at what it says. But strong meat longer to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use. So how do you mature? By reason of use. By reason of use. How do you mature? By reason of use. So use the word and you'll be growing. Use the word and you'll be mature. Use the word and you will overcome all your weaknesses. Use the word and your life will become a better one. Your experiences will be better. So the word is like meat or like solid food, which means it builds and matures the believer because that's what food does. It nurtures you. It nourishes you. It makes you keep growing. Conclusion. Treasure the word of God. Place a great value on it. Look at it as more precious than gold. See like a a great pearl. It's of great value. It can change you, make you better. Open up to the world. When you are hearing it, open up to it. Don't have a closed mind. Don't come to God with a closed mind. Come. Let him teach you. Let him teach you. You don't know more than him. He knows the end from the beginning. He can tell the end from the beginning. He, he has been here before you came. And after your time on earth, he will still be here. Amen, somebody. Hallelujah. His life himself is a life giver. His knowledge, his wisdom, everything comes from him. All knowledge comes from him. All wisdom comes from him. So can you know more about life than the author of life? No. Can you know more about marriage than the author of marriage? No. No. He said, when the spirit shall come, he shall teach you all things. So he knows all things. Open up. Let him educate you. That's why the Bible says, be transformed through the renewal of your mind. To renew your mind means, let me re-educate you about life. Leave what you know. Come, let me re-educate you. Open up your mind to God. I'm telling you, that was what God told me that changed my life. I started out as a Catholic. And I went from meeting to meeting, arguing, 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 and God, God called my attention to it one day. I still remember the place we were in UNN for a program. Say, forget everything you know and you have been taught and I will teach you. And when I said yes, sir, that day, from that day, scriptures opened. Understanding of the words started flowing. Life became different. And I won't believe it because you are a professor in theology. I won't believe it because you are a doctor of divinity holder or doctor of theology holder. No. I believe the word. Open up to it. 
Don't have a closed mind. Believe it with all your heart. Embrace it. Accept it as a final authority on every subject. Walk with it and leave it out. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, I pray that the words we have heard today will not be forgotten by your people. I pray that you will stir their hearts to love your word more, hunger for your word, and practice the word. Create a hunger in them, Father. A thirst that they don't know before. Let there be a great zeal to know you more. May they enjoy reading the word, listening to the word from today. Fulfill the functions of the word as we have seen it in this study. Let this truth become a reality in their lives. Let the word play all these roles. Fulfill all these functions in them all the days of their lives forever. Mature us through your word. The Bible says, so mightily grew the word of God and it prevailed. Let your word prevail over us. Mold us, shape us. Make us what you want us to be. Every devil distracting your people from the word, I rebuke from their lives in Jesus' name. I pray that from today they will pay attention. They will take it unto which they hear and they will use it. They will practice it. And they will have testimonies. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.